Hello and welcome to Successful Wildlife Videography. I'm Mike Lindley and during this training DVD I'm going to be explaining what's involved in professional wildlife filmmaking as well as demonstrating the many filming techniques required. These will include filming medium-sized land animals on location as well as various types of birds. I'll also be showing you some great techniques for filming wildlife in tanks and cages such as fish and reptiles and I'll be covering many aspects of close-up macro videography too. And if you've ever wondered how professional television wildlife filmmakers get some of those seemingly impossible shots, well I'll be giving away many of those great trade secrets of wildlife filmmaking. Of course, equipment is a very big part of making any wildlife program, so I'll be covering that right from the start. If you've bought this DVD, then you must already be into natural history and wildlife which means you've probably seen lots of wildlife programs on television. You might even marvel over the stunning quality of the footage used in these programs and wonder how on earth they achieve such great images. Of course, most television programs are usually filmed and produced using large crews, but it's also possible for you to film and produce wildlife programs with a very small group of people, or even totally on your own. With some basic training and guidance, there's no reason why you too can't write, shoot, edit and produce a professional looking wildlife program. With the help of this training DVD and some practice in the field, you'll soon be well on your way to producing your first wildlife program. And the great thing is, you won't need the most expensive film cameras in the world to do it. Most of the footage you'll be seeing throughout this DVD was filmed here in the UK. I appreciate this is somewhat less than exotic, but sometimes the best place to begin filming wildlife is in your own back garden, or in wildlife parks and zoos. If you live in the country, you should be able to attract a variety of different species into your own back garden, and even in an urban garden, you'll be surprised at the quantity of wildlife around you. Quite often garden wildlife videography can be just as rewarding as an exotic overseas adventure. Having said that, if you venture into wildlife parks and zoos, it's possible to shoot some rare and more exotic breeds in a way that makes them look like they were filmed in the wild. I'll be showing you how this is achieved later in the programme. Over the years, I've used most formats, including 16 and 35mm film, Mini DV, DV Cam, DigiBeta and HD Cam. However, with the recent advent of high-quality, low-priced HD digital acquisition formats, I've recently turned my attention to the superb HDV camcorders. One such range of camcorders are the JVC Pro HD range of professional progressive scan HDV models. These include the 100 series and the 200 series. The ones I'm going to be using throughout this training DVD are the GY HD101 and the GY HD111. Of course, for many years, wildlife programs were shot on 35mm film. But due to the size and weight of these cameras, the Super 16mm format soon became the wildlife filmmaker's weapon of choice, and it continues to be the most frequently used film format for television wildlife programs. When video cameras started to appear on the scene during the 80s, wildlife filmmakers started to look long and hard at these new formats, though back then, the quality of video cameras was somewhat questionable especially when compared to Super 16 film. Today, things are quite different. The quality of the latest HD and HDV camcorders is simply stunning. And as a result, it's being used more and more for wildlife program making. In the past, many filmmakers didn't like the harsh and realistic look of the early DV camcorders. However, the more recent HD and HDV progressive scan models are pretty much on an equal footing with that smooth, pleasing quality of Super 16mm film that professional wildlife filmmakers are used to, with similar colour characteristics too. There's no doubt that the new breed of high-end HD and HDV camcorders have made themselves well and truly at home in wildlife productions. Of course, there are many different makes and models of HD and HDV camcorders available, some working better than others, depending on the application it's being used for. 
Whatever camcorder you own, or plan to buy, the techniques are basically the same. So don't worry if you don't have a JVC Pro HD camcorder. I simply chose these camcorders because they're affordable and readily available and are particularly suited to wildlife filmmaking for a number of very good reasons, which I'll now go through. Firstly, they have professional one third of an inch interchangeable lenses, so you can fit different focal length lenses made specifically for the Pro HD range by both Canon and Fujinon. Also, with the use of an adapter, you can use stills photographic lenses. When using such adapters with stills photographic lenses, the focal length is increased by approximately seven times. This is due to the difference in size between a 35mm frame and the CCD chips in camcorders such as these JVC models. This basically means if you use a 100 to 300 mm stills photographic lens on the JVC with an adapter, you'll end up with a 700 to 2100 mm zoom lens, which is fantastic for filming wildlife from a considerable distance away, as you'll be able to stay outside the animal's circle of fear, yet still fill the frame with the animal due to the massively increased focal length of the lens. Another good reason for using the JVC Pro HD models is because they use the progressive HD1 variant of HDV as opposed to the interlaced HD2. I believe there's a very strong argument for shooting in progressive mode, especially wildlife programs. After all, for many years wildlife programs were shot on film formats such as 16 and 35mm and of course still are. Shooting in progressive mode at 25 frames per second is going to give us that same filmic look of traditional wildlife documentaries. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that progressive shooting formats are there for the sole purpose of making a transfer to film easier. This is not the case. Of course this is one advantage of shooting progressive, but there are many others. Even if you only ever intend burning off a DVD and watching a film on television, the results from a progressive shot production are preferable and more pleasing to watch, especially on the latest LCD television sets, which were designed for progressive video. Well, the first thing I wanted to do was to give you a quick tour of the JVC camera so you can see for yourself why they're so well suited for making wildlife documentaries. First impressions are its build quality. It's very, very tough, ideally suited for work in and out of the field. It has a manual focus lens with a macro feature and a lank socket for remote lens controllers. It also has XLR audio sockets to allow you to record professional quality audio. It has a fold-out LCD screen, which is a great feature for checking composition and exposure. There's also a great focus assist mode to aid with focusing. Of course, these are just some of the features of the JVC camera, but there are many others that make it such a great camera for recording wildlife. Of course, you can't make a wildlife program with a camcorder alone. There are many other pieces of equipment that are essential to any professional wildlife production. Let's take a look at some of the equipment I'll be using throughout this program. As I've already explained, the JVC Pro HD range of camcorders use an interchangeable lens system. The standard lens it comes with is a Fujinon 16x lens. This lens is ideal for wildlife shots that don't require long-range telephoto lenses, for example animals that are used to humans and not scared off or intimidated by us. This is often the case in wildlife parks and many general parks around Britain. When you're filming large friend animals, you'll appreciate the wide end of this lens. When it comes to filming animals in the wild, you'll need a more powerful telephoto lens. This will enable you to frame your subject nicely while maintaining enough distance to prevent you from disturbing the animal. There are two aftermarket companies that make special adapters for the JVC Pro HD cameras. 
These adapters allow you to use Nikon and Canon fit photographic still lenses on the JVC. And as I've already explained, these adapters increase the effective focal length of photographic lenses by approximately seven times. There are two gentlemen in the UK who make these lens adapters. One is the ex-Optex engineer Mike Tapper, and the other is broadcast engineer Les Boscher. Both cost less than £200. The great thing about both these adapters is that there are no glass elements in them. They are simply metal adapters designed solely to allow the use of photographic lenses, so there is no quality loss or other abnormal lens aberrations or distortions. Once you have an adapter, be it for Nikon or Canon, you can use these stills photographic lenses on your JVC Pro HD camcorder. I'd recommend using a 100 to 300 mm zoom lens simply because this equates to a 700 to 2100 mm zoom lens once mounted on the JVC via the adapter. This is an ideal range. The 700 mm end of the zoom lens will allow you to scan for wildlife. Then you can zoom into the 2100 end to film the frame with your subject. A smallish bird will fill the frame from about 100 meters away. Pretty impressive. I wouldn't recommend a long prime lens such as a 400mm as this will equate to about 2800mm and will be very difficult to find your subject in the frame due to the massive magnification. A zoom lens is easier to use and is more useful as it will allow you to zoom out, find your subject and then zoom back in to frame it. Having said that, even using a long zoom lens you'll notice that it can be difficult to pinpoint a distant subject within the viewfinder or in the camera's LCD screen because long lenses have a very narrow angle of view. The trick is to pay attention to any key environmental features around your subject while you're observing it with your eyes. This trick will help you orientate yourself when it comes to looking through the camcorder's viewfinder or LCD screen. When using a stills photographic zoom lens in a setup like this, it's best to treat the zoom lens as a set of prime lenses. Don't be tempted to carry out a video style zoom shot such as an establishing shot where you zoom out slowly. Photographic stills lenses are not designed for video style zoom shots and they'll usually have some very strange effects if you try, such as the image jumping around during the zoom. This is more obvious at the beginning and end of the zoom so avoid zoom shots altogether when it comes to photographic zoom lenses. The lens I'm going to be using throughout this program is a Sigma 100-300 FO APO digital lens. This lens costs around £700 new and because the optics have been optimised for use with digital stills SLR cameras it works just as well with this digital camcorder as both use electronic CCD chips. Of course, you might choose to go for a different brand, such as Nikon or Canon. Whichever lens you decide on, I'd recommend taking your camcorder and adapter along to the shop to shoot a bit of test footage before buying. Try out two or three different brands of lens while you're there. When you're shooting, make sure your camcorder's mic is turned on. Then simply say aloud the make and model of lens you're shooting on. This way, when you're checking the footage later, you'll know what clips were shot with which lens. You'll also need to take your tripod along as handheld shots with long lenses are impossible. Once you've shot some test footage with different lenses, go home and play it back on your TV or edit suite monitor to check the results for quality. Depending on which stills photographic lens you use in your camcorder, you may or may not need to buy an additional lens support system. If your photographic stills zoom lens is about the same weight or perhaps only slightly heavier than its standard lens, then you won't need to buy an additional lens support system. If, however, you buy a photographic lens that's considerably heavier, such as the Sigma one I'm using here, then you'll need to invest in a lens support system. If you use a heavy lens with no support system, the lens could have a tendency to droop down slightly, which could put extra strain on the camcorder's lens mount and body. The one I'm using here is made by a company called True Lens Services, who are based in the Midlands in England. This lens support system costs around £270 and it works like any standard matte box rail system by screwing into the camera's tripod bush. There's a bracket attached to the rails that slides along into the desired position with a bolt that screws into the lens's built-in tripod bush. When assembling a configuration like this, it's important to fit the system onto the camcorder's tripod bush first, then you should fit the lens onto the camcorder in a vertical position.
This way, when you attach the lens, there is no undue strain on the camcorder's lens mount. Keep the camera and lens in the vertical position. Slide the support bracket along the bars until it's level with the lens's tripod bush, then screw the bolt into place and secure it using the two locking wheel nuts. This will prevent the lens from drooping down and putting stress on the camcorder's lens mount when you tilt the camera back into a horizontal shooting position. Now the camcorder, mount and lens should be tightly locked together and ready for use in its more natural horizontal position. Due to the sheer focal length of some telephoto lenses, the tripod is by far the most important piece of equipment in the setup. There's no way on earth that you could hold a camcorder when zoomed into 2100mm and expect to get steady shots. Not only will you need a tripod for filming wildlife, but you'll need a professional one with a professional fluid head. The same goes for the legs, which must be rock solid. Shaky camera work looks amateurish and is frustrating to watch, so it's important that you use a professional tripod to ensure smooth, steady shots. Don't be afraid to use locked off shots. These are shots where you lock the camera off on the tripod so it remains perfectly still. This will always be preferable to any shaky movements. Personally, I always use and recommend the Vinton Vision range of tripods for filming wildlife simply because they're the only tripod maker in the world who use a perfect balance system, which is essential for wildlife filmmaking with long lenses. Also, the fluid heads have virtually no drift back, which means when you get to the end of a smooth pan, the head will stay there and will creep back a few millimetres like many other cheaper branded tripods. The Vincent Vision heads are incredibly smooth and you have a huge amount of control over the amount of drag, for the pan and tilt via the dials on the head. The same goes for the balancing. A perfectly balanced head means that you can tilt the head into any position, then take your hand off the pan handle and the head and camera will stay in that position as if by magic. The vision range allows you to balance the camera in this way by adjusting the large perfect balance dial on the head. This dial is effectively dialing in more or less tension on an industrial strength spring inside the head. This spring forces the head back up to its horizontal position and by adjusting the amount of tension on the spring you can get the camera to stay in any tilted position without it drooping back or forth. The tripod legs are equally important. Top quality carbon or alloy legs are a must for long range wildlife work. The legs must have no wind up in them or this could affect panning shots drastically, especially when zoomed in. Wind up basically means that when you get to the end of a pan and stop, there's a minuscule amount of extra movement as the legs straighten out. Imagine for a second that your tripod legs were made of rubber and you locked off the head. If you tried to pan, the legs would simply twist around each other, though when you let go of the pan handle, the legs would spring back into a straight position. Well, there is a tiny amount of this wind up in lots of tripod legs. The cheaper the legs, the more wind up. More expensive tripod legs have a lot less wind-up. The legs that come as standard with a vision range, both carbon and alloy, have been engineered in such a way that they don't have any wind-up, so they're ideal for panning wildlife at long range. For wildlife work, you'll need these incredibly smooth actions and balancing capabilities of the head and the rigidness of the legs. A single-stage Vincent Vision 6 with alloy legs will cost you around £1,600 but you'll know where the extra money went when you use it. Also, I've had some of my Vision Series tripods for many years. They've been stuck in swamps, dropped in lakes and rivers, used in the mud, as well as many other extreme environments, from sandy and blisteringly hot deserts to freezing Arctic conditions. Yet they continue to work flawlessly year in, year out. In an ideal world, all wildlife footage would be shot from a tripod, but this isn't always possible especially if you're in a hurry to grab footage of an animal that you know won't be hanging around for very long. You should practice various techniques for holding your camcorder steady until you find one that suits you. This is easier with shoulder mounted camcorders with standard non-telephoto lenses. If your subject is moving such as birds in flight or a galloping horse, practice the technique of tracking them by moving the camera at the same speed as a subject. 
and don't forget to leave room in the frame for the animal to move into. This is known as the looking room. Batteries are one of the most underestimated pieces of equipment for wildlife work, yet they are the one of the most important. Shooting any wildlife can, and usually does, require a lot of patience, and sitting around waiting for the ultimate shot. Even when your camcorder is in standby mode, it uses up almost as much energy as when it is in record mode. This is because the heads simply lift off the tape when in standby, but the motors and heads are still spinning. Because of this, and the many hours spent filming in the wild, long battery life is vital. For use with the JVC, I'm going to be using a professional Hawkwoods V-Lock battery adapter, which will allow me to use full-size professional V-Lock type batteries. The small standard JVC battery that comes with the Pro HD models will only give you about 35 minutes record time. With the Hawkwoods V-Lock adapter and the use of one of the Hawkwoods VL range of batteries, you can get far greater recording times. With the VL100, you can achieve a continuous record time of around 5 hours. And with the VL160, it's possible to get 8 hours of continuous recording time, which is pretty much an entire day's shooting on just one battery. These long recording times are very much needed when filming wildlife as it often involves sitting in a hide for a few days at a time to get the shot you want. As any professional cameraman or sound recordist will tell you, the sound is just as important as the images. In fact, more so in certain situations. So a high quality professional long rifle mic is essential when filming wildlife. Whatever you do, don't be tempted to use a built-in microphone or the detachable microphone that came with your camcorder, as more often than not they can't record from long range and the quality of sound is often questionable. There are many excellent brands of microphones from companies such as Sony, Sennheiser, Bayer and Audio-Technica. The ones I'll be using throughout this DVD are both Audio-Technica models. The AT4071A costs around £700 and is a long-range rifle mic that's been designed specifically for recording sounds directly to the front and some distance away. This mic will do a great job of picking up sounds when the subject is some considerable distance from the camera and if you've no choice but to have the microphone camera mounted. These long gun mics are known as hypercardioid mics and have been designed in such a way that they'll only pick up the sounds that are directly in front. No sound is picked up from behind or to the sides, which makes them ideal for picking up animal sounds straight ahead whilst filtering out ambient noise that might be going on behind you and to the sides when you're filming. However, there's a limit to the effective range of these mics. Don't expect to pick up sounds of a deer tiptoeing through the undergrowth from 300 yards away. In these instances, you would use what's called Foley sound during post-production. I'll be talking more about this subject later in the programme. The other Audio-Technica model is the AT897, which costs around £175. This is a short rifle mic that's more suited to picking up sounds that are much closer to the camera such as garden wildlife or farm animals. I'll be using this mic when I'm much closer to the subjects I'm filming. Finally, if you intend using a presenter in your wildlife programme, you'll need to invest in a Lavalier mic like the one I'm wearing right now. These little mics are also known as tie clip mics and they're designed to pick up close range sounds from just a few inches away. This is good as you don't want the mic to pick up sound from the other side of the room or when you're shooting outside on location. You'll only want your presenter's voice to be picked up. The sound quality you'll get from one of these tiny mics will be far better and a lot clearer than anything you could achieve with a boom mic that would have to be held out of shot and further away. The best type of the Valier mics to go for are the wireless ones. This means your presenter can walk around freely with no wires. The one I'm wearing is made by Sennheiser and it's called an EW112P system. It comes with a transmitter pack that's worn by the presenter and a receiver pack 
that's attached to the camera and plugged into its XLR socket. Both transmitter and receiver have a tiny aerial and have a range of about 100 meters. Because of this great range, they can also be used for recording close-up animal sounds by placing them next to a bird's nest or at the entrance of a burrow. Of course, shooting wildlife means shooting outdoors, so a high-quality microphone windshield will be required to eliminate any wind noise that the microphone would otherwise pick up. Keeping the fur brushed helps keep it fluffed up and more transparent to the audio. One of the best makers of such products is Rycoat. These Rycoat softies are manufactured using only the finest acoustic materials so they don't interfere with the sound quality. Because audio is such an important part of wildlife filmmaking, being able to monitor the audio that's been recorded to tape is vital. A professional set of enclosed headphones should be high on your shopping list. Enclosed headphones block out sound from the outside world, so you only hear what's being picked up by the microphone. The slight downside is that if someone is standing behind you and not directly in front of the microphone, you might not hear them if they speak to you. Some of the top brands of enclosed broadcast monitoring headphones are Bayer, Sony and Sennheiser. Bayer make a great set of enclosed headphones called the DT250, which sell for around £80. Sennheiser also make an industry standard set of enclosed headphones called the HD25. These are the kind of headphones you'll need to monitor your audio accurately. The matte box is by far the single most important piece of equipment you can buy to improve the quality of your footage. The matte box is quite often overlooked by many wildlife filmmakers who think the lens hood that came with their camcorder does the same thing. This couldn't be further from the truth. The sorry attempt for a lens shade that comes with most camcorders doesn't really count. To be effective, the shade needs to extend some distance in front of the front element of the lens and have a fully adjustable French flag across the top and preferably side flags too. Having an effective matte box lens shade is doubly important for wildlife videography, as lots of wildlife footage is often filmed from some distance away, so we need to control the light and haze effectively, or we could lose definition, contrast and colour saturation. Backlighting a subject using the sun in early morning or late in the afternoon is often the most flattering way of lighting the subject. In situations like this, a matte box fitted with a French flag is vital if you want to retain contrast and detail in your footage. The matte box should be very high up on your list of accessories for the following reasons. Your camcorder is designed to collect and control the reflected light entering its lens, and the matte box is probably the most practical and significant step towards controlling that light. Not only does the matte box shade the front element of the lens from stray shafts of light, but it also has a mechanism for attaching a variety of filters such as neutral density, polarising, graduated and many other various effects filters. A good quality matte box will be an indispensable addition to your equipment and will go a long way to improving the quality, contrast, colour saturation and definition of your footage. You could see the matte box as a kind of baseball cap for your lens. By keeping the sun out of its eyes, it will see everything with a lot more clarity and definition. The idea is to get the French flag on top of the matte box as close to the top edge of the image frame as possible, without it coming into frame of course. To do this, put your index finger across the front edge of the flag between the tip and the first joint. Then move the flag down until the tip of your finger shows in the top of the frame in the viewfinder. It's important that your finger is in contact with the edge of the flag between its tip and first joint. Any less, and you run the risk of the matte box cutting into the edge of the frame. Any more, and you won't get the full light shading benefits it was designed for. Remember, when you change the focal length of the lens for another shot, you must also readjust the French flag in the same way as before. Quite often amateur filmmakers will set the flag, then zoom out for another shot and forget to readjust it. Then in the final shot they end up with a flag coming into frame which looks like a widescreen letterbox effect across the top of the picture.
Of course, a matte box is not only designed to be a great sunshade for your lens, a good matte box will also have filter trays to hold glass effects filters. There are many situations when filming wildlife where filters will enhance your footage. There are many different types of filters available, such as skylight and UV, graduated filters and of course the polarising filter. The filters I'm using on this DVD are made by Format. The precision and optical quality of these filters is of such a high standard that they won't degrade or affect the quality of your camcorder's lens. Neutral density filters won't be required if you're using a JVC camcorder like the ones I'm using, as they already have two built in. These are accessible via the filter switch on the side of the body. You'll find that many other camcorders like this will also have some built-in ND filters. ND filters are plain grey pieces of glass designed to absorb light entering the lens. You could almost think of them as sunglasses for your camera. ND filters don't affect the quality of light entering the lens, just the quantity. They're basically designed to help you get the exposure you want. For example, you might want an aperture setting of f4, but the bright sunlight is forcing you to use f8. By switching in one of the ND filters, you can reduce the light entering the lens by a few f-stops, and this will allow you to control your exposure and depth of field more accurately. Another filter you should have in your kit is a polarizer. Light bounces around in all kinds of directions, and this can cause reflections in water and on the leaves of plants and trees. A polarizing filter is the only way to eliminate or reduce these reflections. In order to do this, the filter must be rotated until the maximum reduction of unwanted reflection has been achieved. A polarizing filter can make the difference between just OK footage and stunning footage. The polarizer has the most dramatic effect for scenes including sky, water, vegetation such as flowers and trees. Digital video formats can suffer from what's known as burnout. This burnout appears in the bright areas of the image, such as whites or bright silver. Burnout is more obvious in the highlights on wet or shiny animals, or on wet surfaces that show up as bright speckles of light that contain little or no detail. A polarising filter will fix these problems. Another use of the polarising filter is allow you to film fish and other aquatic animals without picking up the surface reflection on the water, especially when filming fish in clear water from above. As you rotate the polarizing filter to its optimum setting, the surface reflections of the water will disappear, revealing the fish below the surface. If you're shooting outdoors on a bright sunny day, the polarizing filter can also be used to enhance color saturation to the sky, while adding depth and separation to the clouds, which will result in a more dramatic and three-dimensional effect. Using a polarizing filter in this way, you'll add an overall more professional look to your finished wildlife program. Take a look at this shot with no polarizing filter. Now look at what happens to the color saturation in the sky and the added dimension to the cloud definition when we add the polarizing filter. A very significant difference indeed. You can also vary the effect by rotating the filter. When shooting trees and green landscapes, the polarizing filter will improve the color saturation of the leaves as well as reducing the speckles of reflected light. Although you can't always see them with the naked eye, leaves and grass reflect millions of tiny white speckles which bleach out on compressed digital tape formats. The polarizing filter eliminates these reflections, so the final result will show the leaves just as they should be saturated with colour and with no washed out speckly reflections. If you're shooting wildlife that's surrounded by foliage, using a polarising filter will often give you the professional results you're looking for. You should also have a UV filter permanently attached to the screw thread in the front of your lens. This won't affect the matte box or any of the filters you use. The UV filter absorbs ultraviolet rays, which are invisible to the naked eye. But on a clear day, these rays will produce a bluish-green colour cast on foliage when shooting animals during the day. The UV filter will also protect your camcorder's CCD chips from damaging UV rays, as well as protecting the front element of your lens from scratches. It's much cheaper to replace a scratched UV filter than it is to replace the front element of an expensive lens or sun-damaged CCD chip. Then there are graduated filters. 
These can really enhance a shot, especially those scenic establishing shots or cutaway landscape shots that are often shown between scene changes. Graduated filters are normally used to give the sky a more dynamic look or to change its colour to make it look like an intense red sunset or tobacco coloured graduated skyline. Take a look at this shot with no graduated filter. This establishing shot looks fine, but look what happens when a graduated filter is put into place. Much more dramatic, and it really brings a scene to life. It's important that you don't use filters just for the sake of it, especially with certain special effects filters. They should only be used to enhance a shot. If a filter effect is noticeable to the viewer, then it's drawing attention to itself and rather than enhancing the image, it will detract from it, disturbing the flow of your program. If you are in any doubt as to whether a particular shot requires a filter or not, I'd recommend not using one. Remember the motto, if in doubt, leave it out. Of course, you could always shoot the scene twice, once with and once without the filter. This way, you'll always have the choice during the editing stage. Finally, when shooting with filters, the camera generally needs to be mounted on a tripod, as handheld shots will almost certainly draw attention to the filter effects. This is even more obvious if you're using a graduated filter. Of course, we all have to use tapes when making programs, but which one should we use? For me, the answer to this question is quite simple. I'd always recommend using the best possible quality tape made by the same manufacturer of your camcorder. In this instance, that would be the JVC DV63 Pro HD tapes. It's possible that incompatibility issues can occur when using tapes by other manufacturers. These issues can include clogged or dirty heads, as well as other parts of the tape drive mechanism, which may in turn cause dropouts and other artefacts. It's also possible that the tapes can become worn out quite fast, or even damaged, so stick to the best quality tapes made by the same company that makes your camcorder, and don't skimp on the price. It's simply not worth risking your priceless footage by trying to save a few pounds. Filming wildlife often involves working in all kinds of hostile weather conditions, including rain, snow, damp, cold or windy and dusty conditions. So quality protection for your equipment is paramount to keeping it free from dust, sand and rain. There are many different manufacturers of equipment cases. The ones I'm using are made by Cutter. Cases like these are made from tough materials and are made specifically to protect your equipment from the worst weather conditions, as well as the usual knocks that they might endure while shooting on expeditions. You can even be resourceful by using other containers to protect your equipment. I've bought a range of different sized tough plastic tubs from my local office supply store to keep lots of smaller pieces of equipment such as lenses, microphones, cables, tapes and batteries and small macro and underwater equipment. Of course a camera bag will only protect your camera when it's packed away inside. For those times when I'm shooting outside in the rain, I use a rain cover. Rain covers are designed to keep the elements off your camcorder whilst leaving plenty of room inside for you to control the camcorder effectively. Another piece of equipment you might want to look into is a portable hide. The main company in the UK for these products is Wildlife Watching Supplies. This is one of their dome hides called a C30 and it retails at just over £200 for the large version. A dome hide like this will allow you to get incredibly close to your subject, as you'll see later in the programme. Well that's all the main equipment that I'm going to be using. Now let's take a look at how I'm going to be using it. At this stage, I'd like to point out the importance of using your camcorder in full manual mode. This applies to both the audio and video. 
I'm not going to give you a lesson in camcorder shooting techniques as that's another training DVD altogether. I just want to stress that there's no place for automatic control in wildlife videography. This is another reason why I'm using JVC Pro HD camcorders as they use full manual focus lenses and have no autofocus functions so you have no choice but to focus the lens manually. This is a good thing as it means all your shots will be in focus as you have to manually focus the lens yourself unlike autofocus lenses with servo motors which can hunt and drift resulting in somewhat less than professional results. If your camcorder has an autofocus function that can be switched to a manual mode get used to using it in manual mode. Using your camcorder in manual focus mode is especially important when shooting wildlife. Animals move and if you use the autofocus feature your camcorder will constantly hunt for the right focus as the animal moves across the frame and you'll probably end up with unusable footage. Generally the autofocus feature on camcorders does more harm than good. It's unprofessional and for lazy people who don't want to give any thought to what they're doing at the shooting stage. Don't be one of them. Get into the habit of doing things the professional way, the manual way, and you'll benefit from professional looking footage later. After a while it will become second nature and you'll be able to focus quicker and more intelligently than the camera ever could in autofocus mode. If you use a camcorder that has an autofocus lens with a manual focus override, get used to using the manual mode every time. The autofocus feature uses something of a best guess technique, which more often than not doesn't work if the subject is partially obscured by vegetation or you want to frame it off centre using the rule of thirds technique. If your camcorder has an autofocus lens, it's always best to leave it set to manual mode, then place your subject in the centre of the frame and depress the push focus button so your subject snaps into focus. Then let go of the push focus button so the camera reverts back to manual mode. This will prevent any dreaded focus hunt that can happen when vegetation starts moving in the wind in the immediate vicinity of the animal you're filming. Because focus is critically important when shooting wildlife, I use a rather clever device called a focus control unit. This particular one is called a DV Studio Rig Follow Focus System made by Crozial. Crozial have pretty much become the industry standard for professional map boxes and follow focus systems. The manual focus control dial on this system is silky smooth, yet very positive in its operation. This really helps you get perfect focus. Having a focus control mounted on the matte box bars will make focusing a lot easier and a lot more accurate compared to using the focus barrel on the lens, especially when you're trying to fine tune your focus. Because the focus control is mounted to the side of the lens, it falls at a more natural angle for the operator, making operation much easier as your wrist isn't twisted at an awkward angle. Because of this side mounting, you don't have to take your eye from the viewfinder to find it and you won't go grabbing the zoom ring or aperture ring by mistake. When it comes to exposure, some animals are more difficult to expose for than others. Black or white animals can be difficult to expose for correctly. To overcome this problem, it's far better to take your exposure reading off a neutral tone in the immediate vicinity of the animal, such as the grass or rocks, then set your camcorder using those readings. The exposure should also be set manually. Resist the temptation to use the auto iris feature as this will become very noticeable when there's a change of light or the depth of field changes in accordance with the iris stopping down and opening up automatically. Setting the exposure manually will always give you superior results. As an aid, I use a zebra mode to show me any overexposed or hot spots in the image. After a while, you'll get used to how a perfectly exposed image should look on either the camera's LCD screen or better still an external field monitor. If you don't already own a grey card you should go out and buy one. They're called 18% middle tone grey cards and their purpose is to provide you with an accurate standard reference of exposure. There are many different ways of adjusting your exposure be it in a studio environment with artificial lighting or on location in the sun. As I've already mentioned, using the auto-exposure feature is a non-starter. 
The remaining methods involve using your eyes as you manually adjust the iris. This could be with the help of a calibrated monitor or by using the camcorder zebra stripes on the LCD screen. You could also push the auto exposure button temporarily to get a rough starting point of what the camera thinks the exposure should be, then fine tune the iris manually. On camcorders that use standard manual bayonet lenses, there's a slider just in front of the zoom rocker switch that allows you to set the exposure to auto or manual. Most professionals would leave this set to manual. But what you can then do is push the temporary auto button that sits in front of the slider switch. As long as you hold this button down, the camera will temporarily go into auto iris mode. Then when you take your finger off, the camera returns to manual. This is a good way to achieve a good starting point for your exposure. Now this is where the 18% grey card comes in. When you push this button, the camera exposes the scene as accurately as it can based on what it sees. The metering systems in the camcorders measure reflected light and are designed in such a way that the metering electronics assume that the camera is seeing 18% neutral grey. When you point your camcorder at a subject, the sensors inside the device assess the level of light reflected from it. Because the camcorder has no knowledge of the colour or tone of the subject, it makes an assessment by assuming that the subject is 18% grey, otherwise known as mid-tone grey. This middle-tone grey reading is the industry standard, so a camcorder's metering system will always give a technically accurate exposure reading for mid-tone subjects. But what if the subject you're filming isn't mid-tone? In these instances, if you push the auto exposure button temporarily, the camera will try to make the animal appear mid-tone by underexposing by about one and a half stops. The same goes for the dark subject. Pushing the auto exposure button temporarily will lead to the camcorder rendering the animal mid-tone by overexposing by about one and a half stops. You can take a lot of the guesswork out of situations like this by using an 18% grey card. All camcorders see colour based on a grey scale that ranges from pure white to jet black. In the middle is 18% grey. Every colour in the world falls somewhere on this scale. Knowing where will allow you to set the right amount of exposure compensation. Using an 18% grey card will virtually guarantee perfect exposures when you're filming animals or other subjects that are not middle tone. The technique for achieving perfect exposure using a grey card is virtually the same as achieving perfect white balancing using a white card. Here's how it works. Set your camcorder up for the shot as normal. Then place a grey card in the same light as a subject or have an assistant hold it there. Then zoom in and fill the frame with a grey card just as you would with a white card when using white balancing. Then push and hold the auto exposure button and hold it until the camcorder has adjusted the exposure to the card. When you zoom out and recompose your shot, it should be perfectly exposed. Once you've carried out a grey card exposure reading, you can of course fine tune the exposure to your taste using the iris wheel on the lens. You can also record two short clips, one with the grey card filling the frame, then zoom out of it to include the card and some of the scene and record that too. Record about 30 seconds of each. This will enable you to use them for practical reference during editing. And it will provide an accurate reference for colour and exposure when graded to 18% neutral grey. By carrying out a grey card test at least you'll know that your camcorder was actually exposing off an accurate middle tone grey area and not a mountainside that might have been slightly more or less than middle tone. It's also very important to remember that many wildlife images, particularly animals surrounded by lots of foliage, will always benefit from being slightly underexposed. In some cases this is crucial, such as a light-coloured animal against a dark background. CCD chips retain better detail in the shadow areas than the highlight areas, so if you're in any doubt about your exposure, underexpose slightly. This will also help saturate colours better. In these situations it's often hard to judge how much you should underexpose your footage, but with time you'll get enough experience to perfect the art of underexposing according to the animal or scene. If the light is poor and you need to shoot with your lens wide open, your depth of field will be drastically reduced, especially when shooting with a long telephoto lens. Depth of field is the amount of image that appears in focus between the foreground and the horizon. 
It's related to the focal length of your lens, the aperture the lens is set to, the zoom setting and the distance to the subject. The larger the focal length of the lens, the less depth of field the lens will provide. With a given lens, the greater the aperture, say f22 as opposed to f4, the more depth of field you will have. The distance to the subject will also determine the amount of depth of field. With wildlife videography, it's more desirable to have a small depth of field, making the subject stand out in a crisp focus against an out of focus background. This helps define the subject. With a wide aperture and a very long telephoto lens, the depth of field can be the difference between the front and back of a deer's head. In these situations, it's vital that you focus on the animal's eyes, as the eyes are invariably the natural place of you will look. This is especially important with extreme close-up shots or macro work, where only part of the animal is in focus. For reasons such as these, it's very important to keep your aperture and depth of field in mind when filming wildlife. As with the video, the audio should also be set manually. If you've taken the time and trouble to buy a decent microphone, then you owe it to the mic to adjust the audio levels manually to be sure of recording professional sounding audio that's at a constant level. There's nothing worse than audio that was recorded using the auto gain setting, as audio levels tend to jump up and down to compensate for sudden noises, which results in very amateurish sounding audio. This can happen if you're filming in a quiet environment and an animal suddenly makes a loud noise. <coughs> what will happen is the natural atmospheric sound will suddenly drop. Then when the animal sound stops, the sound of the atmosphere will come back up. This sounds bad and will be unusable. When setting your audio gain levels, set them so they peak at around minus 12 dB when the loudest sounds are heard. This setting will be shown on the record level indicator lights on your camcorder. Quite often the difference between an amateur production and a professional one lies in the sound. This is because many non-professionals don't pay enough attention to the audio side of their productions. Sound is just as important as the visuals, even more so in many cases. Having top quality sound in your wildlife program will really make it stand out. As I've already mentioned in the microphone section, it's always best to use professional quality microphones, bought separately and not the camcorder's built-in one. You should also use professional quality enclosed headphones for monitoring your audio levels when you're setting up a shot. This way you can be sure that the audio you're hearing through the headphones is the same as what's being recorded onto the tape. Finally, whatever your shooting situation, make sure you always record about two minutes of what's known as wild track audio. You don't have to be filming anything visually, in fact you can leave the lens cap on. Simply wait until there are no aeroplanes flying overhead or any other unnatural sounds such as cars or people, then press the record button and stand perfectly still and keep quiet for about two minutes while you record the natural atmosphere. Recording a wild track will allow you to cover up any bad audio during the editing stage. For example, you might have a great shot of a fox chasing a rabbit, but it's spoilt by an aeroplane flying overhead. In this instance, you could take part of your wild track audio and use it to replace the bad audio with the aeroplane in it. You should record a separate wild track for every location you film in, as each location's atmosphere will sound different and have its own audio characteristics. For example, the atmosphere deep in a forest won't be the same as the atmosphere in an open valley. One of the most important things about filming wildlife is composition. It's possible to shoot footage that's technically perfect with regards to focus and exposure, but it will still look unprofessional if the composition is all wrong. There are a number of rules that need to be followed if you want your footage to look totally professional. Composition is a very subjective thing, but I would always say that it's good to know the rules, so when you're breaking them, you're doing so by creative design. Many beginner filmmakers simply place a subject they're filming bang in the middle of the frame. While this may seem like an obvious choice, it's not always the best position. If you follow the rule of thirds system, you'll rarely have a badly composed shot. The rule of thirds will ensure artistic and professional looking shots every time. Following this rule is fairly straightforward. 
Simply divide the picture up into thirds, both horizontally and vertically, then place your subject on one of the four cross sections. Only you will know which of the four cross sections to place a subject on, but you'll soon get an eye for what looks right. Always leave looking room in front of the subject. If the animal is looking from left to right, you would place it on one of the two cross sections on the left side of the frame. This gives the animal room in the frame to look into, which is more pleasing and comfortable to watch in the final program. The same rules apply for animals that are walking or swimming. Make sure you leave walking room for the animal to move into when panning a moving animal. For establishing landscape shots, try placing the horizon on one of the two horizontal lines. If there's a lot of subject matter in the ground, then place the horizon on the top line. If, on the other hand, there's more interesting subject matter in the top half of the frame, such as a nice cloud formation or sunset, then place the horizon on the bottom line. You'll be amazed at how pleasing your footage will look using the rule of thirds. However, don't be afraid to break the rule of thirds if you feel the shot would be better or more artistic. As I've mentioned already, if your subject is moving, such as a flying bird or running fox, it's better to put more space in front of the animal than behind it. This makes it appear that the subject is running towards something rather than running away from something. However, if an animal is generally running away from a predator, then leaving more room in the frame behind the animal could work better, as this will give the impression that the animal is being chased. The rule of thirds can also be broken when filming small objects such as insects. In these instances, think close-up and fill the frame with a subject. In extreme close-up situations like this, it's the detail on the insect that your viewers will be interested in. When it comes to camera angles, the most important rule is to be on the same eye line as the animal you're filming. This means that your camcorder should be on the same level as the animal's eyes. If you're filming a medium-sized animal such as a deer or a lion, filming from about waist height from a tripod will roughly be on a level with the animal's eyes. If, however, you're filming a smaller animal, you would need to mount your camera virtually on the ground with a lens just a few inches above the grass. Also, looking up at an animal will always be better than a shot that looks down. However, this will make the animal appear more dominant. Next, there's a point of view shot, usually abbreviated to POV. They're called POV shots because they're taken from the point of view of the animal that you're filming. For example, if you've just filmed a fox running through some long grass, you could then go over to the grass and hold your camcorder low to the ground at the same level as a fox and then hit the record button and run through the grass as if your camcorder was the fox. When you cut away from the footage of the fox to the footage you shot with your camcorder running through the grass, it will appear to the viewer that they're seeing life through the fox's eyes as it runs. When you're recording POV shots like this, remember to set your lens to its widest setting which will allow you to keep more of the picture in focus whilst keeping the jerkiness to a minimum. But don't worry about a little bit of jerkiness as you run because this will make your footage more realistic. When it comes to composing your shot using the zoom lens, make sure you get a nice selection of shot sizes. Don't continuously film mid shots where the entire animal is in frame. Also get some wider establishing shots as well as mid shots and then shoot plenty of close up shots of the animal's eyes, face and any other relevant parts of interest like close ups of the markings on a leopard or the tip of a rattlesnake's tail. At the very least you'll need to get three shots. A wide establishing shot that shows the animal in its surroundings. This will give the scale and show off its location. Then get the mid shot, which shows the entire animal filling the frame. Then finally some close-up shots of its head and other body parts to help cut the sequence together. I'd recommend getting just 8 to 10 seconds of the three basic wide, mid and close-up shots. Then if the animal flees the scene, at least you'll have the shots required to make up the sequence. If the animal is still around, you can start to get more creative with other longer shots and to even think about changing your shooting angle by moving from your current shooting position. Take a look at these two sequences. The first one is a bad example that uses shots of a similar size that just don't cut together well at all. 
This sequence simply doesn't tell a story at all. In fact, it's just plain dull. Now let's take a look at a sequence of varying shot sizes to see what a huge difference it makes. This is much better. It starts off with a nice wide establishing shot, then it cuts to a mid shot, then a few close ups to complete the story. This sequence looks professional and is much more pleasing to watch. Most people seem to like shots where there's a combination of three animals of the same species in frame. Don't ask me why, but footage with three animals generally looks better than footage with two or four animals. For example, three geese flying in the shape of the letter V, or three lions walking along next to each other. Also, try to capture those moments where two or more animals are doing exactly the same thing, such as a couple of zebras drinking water, or some animals with their heads all turned in the same direction. This makes interesting footage, but like all wildlife filmmaking, an element of patience will be required. To prevent your wildlife footage looking like stagnant passport photos, wait until the animal shows some aspect of behaviour before hitting the record button. For instance, cubs playing, a lion washing itself, horses galloping, or perhaps two cock pheasants fighting. This makes for more interesting viewing than a static leopard resting in the shade. When shooting any wildlife, it's important to pay attention to the background, which may or may not be out of your control. If the composition doesn't look right and you have the time, try moving around, especially when working with long lenses, as stepping a few yards to the one side can provide you with a totally different viewpoint and perhaps a more pleasing background. If you're using shorter focal length lenses, creating strong images of animals in their environment is often a lot more challenging than when shooting a frame filler with a telephoto lens. If your subject looks small in the frame, Make sure it fits into a composition of interesting shapes with plenty of varying subject matter. Following the rule of thirds when shooting with a shorter focal length lens is even more important. Panning shots can often make nice cutaways of landscapes and other interesting subjects. You'll also need to pan animals as they move. When carrying out a panning shot, keep it slow and very smooth, unless it's a running cheetah, in which case you'll have to pan as fast as the animal is running. And remember about walking room. Leave plenty of room for the animal to walk or to run into when you compose a shot. It's also good practice to pan the animal for a while, then when you're ready to end the shot, simply stop panning and allow the animal to walk out of frame leaving just the landscape in shot. This will produce an easy cutting point in post-production or a nice sequence end, but remember once the animal has walked out of frame to leave your camera recording for an additional 5 or 10 seconds to allow for a fade out during post-production. These extra seconds are known as handles. If it's a panning shot of a landscape to be used for an establishing shot, do a couple of dry runs of the pan first to practice the speed and start and finish points. Then once you're confident you can pull the shot off, hit the record button and go for a take. When panning scenic landscape shots, it's important to remember that the first and last frame of the pan must hold up on their own. You have to imagine that the image in the viewfinder at the beginning of the pan will make a nice still photo in its own right. The same applies for the image in the viewfinder when you get to the end of the pan. What happens during the pan is not as important as long as you start and stop on something of interest and to hold the shot at each end for five seconds or so to give the viewer a chance to absorb them as well as leaving you enough handle for editing. When it comes to zoom shots, try and avoid them. Most professionals don't use zoom shots. Instead they use tracks, but this isn't always possible when filming wildlife. There are a few exceptions, such as an establishing shot, but keep it slow and smooth. For pans and tilts, keep them slow, smooth and at a constant speed so they don't detract from the subject you're filming. It's vital that your pans don't speed up, slow down or fluctuate during the pan. Keep the speed absolutely constant throughout. The speed and smoothness is even more important if you're shooting in progressive mode. If you pan too fast, your footage will take on a juddering effect. 
This is the nature of progressive. Just as it is with film formats shooting at 24 or 25 frames per second. So when shooting progressive, make sure your pans are very slow and if possible monitor them so you know just how fast you can pan before the critical judder point occurs. Before you consider going out to shoot any footage, you should have a well-prepared plan of action. You should know what sort of programme you're going to be shooting. For example, a wildlife documentary for television, a wildlife programme for DVD distribution, a short sequence for the web, or a CD-ROM multimedia, or perhaps a short clip for local television news. Or maybe you're putting together a showreel. Whatever it's for, you'll need to plan your shoot accordingly. Once you've decided on the kind of programme you're going to make, you should start by writing out a short one-page synopsis of what your programme is going to be about. This will help you get a clear idea of your programme. It's important that your programme tells a story with a beginning, middle and end, and that you know exactly how it will start and finish. The ending is the most important part of any film or programme, so you should know your ending before you know anything else. Then put together a storyboard of your programme. This is basically a bunch of pictures to illustrate your programme. Don't worry if you can't draw very well, as they only have to be rough pencil sketches to help you visualise your programme. Then try to imagine how the narration will go. You can write the narration before you shoot your programme, but it's usually easier to have a basic idea of how your narration will go than write it once the programme has been edited. Remember, you don't have to use narration, it's possible to produce a great wildlife programme made up of your sequences with just a soundtrack of the appropriate music. Finally, you should write up a shot list of all the shots you need to make your wildlife programme. If you've written your narration beforehand, read through it and write down all the shots you'll need. Otherwise, read through your synopsis and ideas to come up with your shot list. It's always good to be thorough when writing up your shot list. Otherwise, if you find you need another shot when you're editing, you'll have to go and get your gear together and drive back out to the location to get it. Because this might not always be possible, it's always best to try and get every single shot during the original filming stages. Many wildlife videographers like to film animals just for the fun of it, but you might want to take it to the next step by producing a completed wildlife film or documentary. If this is the case, you're going to have to plan things more carefully. Most professionally produced wildlife programs that you see on television are split up into four basic stages. Conception, pre-production, production and then finally post-production. The conception is basically the idea for the film. What's it going to be about, the style of the film and the basic topics it's going to cover and the premise of its storyline. The pre-production stage is where you research the subjects of your film the various locations where you're going to film it, the costs involved, any additional help you might need, and of course, to write the script or shortlist. Next comes the production process. This is where you go out and shoot all the shots on your shortlist and any of the footage that you need. You'll also record any sound needed at this point, including wild tracks and other audio that you might need for editing. The final stage is post-production. This is where you edit the footage together into sequences, add sound, narration, graphics and titles, and then finally author it to DVD or output it to a format such as DigiBeta, ready for distribution or broadcast. Once you've decided what your wildlife film is going to be about, you'll have to plan the shots carefully and to shoot all the footage you will need to edit nice storytelling sequences together. If it's your first attempt at making a complete wildlife film, don't try anything too ambitious, such as a story of two Siberian snow tigers as they raise their cubs. Instead, make a film based on a subject that will be easier to film, such as a story of a badger that visits your backyard each night, or the woodpecker that's nesting in a tree at the bottom of your garden. Whatever you base your film on, try and add some drama to make it more interesting for the viewer. Perhaps the stops visiting for a few days, which could be very worrying, then it eventually shows up with its mate. Drama and suspense like this will always make your programme more watchable and interesting. Concentrating on a wildlife oriented project will give you the opportunity to involve other people in your film, which can make for a very good wildlife documentary. 
A good example of this could be based at a local nature reserve where the staff are landscaping a small stretch along the side of a lake in an attempt to attract more kingfishers. There's a good chance they won't mind being filmed and interviewed while the work goes on. This could tell the story of how they made this short stretch of lake bank more appealing to kingfishers by adding height to the bank's edge and planting trees along the edges so there are branches for the kingfishers to perch on while they scan the water for fish. At the end you could film some of the kingfishers and shoot some interviews with the nature reserve staff that were involved in the project. Projects such as this will be good experience as you learn about the entire wildlife filmmaking process from conception to completion. It's very important to shoot a wide variety of shots that you can edit into a series of sequences during post-production. These sequences will build up to tell the story of your wildlife program. Getting a mixed bag of shots that will cut together well is vital to the ingredients of a successful wildlife program. So it's important to resist the temptation to simply hit the record button and record continuously just because there's something there worth filming. Instead, think carefully about your shots and composition by filming between 10 and 15 seconds in one shot size, then recompose the shot by zooming in or out, then record another 10 to 15 seconds and so on, making sure you stop recording while you recompose your shot. By doing this, you'll have to think about your angles and composition, which will lead to better footage that will be a lot easier to edit together than one very long 15 minute clip of chaotic footage. So remember to think very carefully about each shot before hitting the record button. Unless of course something amazing is happening, in which case keep your camcorder rolling to catch all the action. Planning your shots carefully will lead to better quality footage. And because your shooting ratio of usable to unusable footage will be lower, editing will be much easier and less time consuming. There are a number of different lighting situations that you might encounter, and much of it will be out of your control. Your subject may be lit by the sun from the side, front or behind. Generally speaking, footage shot where the light is coming from behind or from the sides will give the most pleasing results. This is known as rim lighting, and it looks particularly good early in the morning or late in the afternoon, when the sun is low in the sky. Filming during the middle of the day when the sun is high in the sky is best avoided as it results in very flat and brightly lit footage. When the sun is lower in the sky during the mid-morning or late afternoon there will be greater shadow detail and warmer tones which will result in more professional looking shots. You should always be aware of the sun's position in its relation to you and the subject when positioning yourself for a shoot. It goes without saying that it's the light in which you're filming that will have the greatest effect on your shots. The quality of natural outdoor light is dependent on many factors. First, sunlight is a directional light source. It will hit your subject at a certain angle depending on your location, the time of year and the time of day. When you're shooting in direct sunlight, you'll experience lighting conditions that will fall into three categories. Front lighting, side lighting and back lighting. Front lighting is where the sun hits your subject directly from the front. In other words, the sun will be behind you when you're filming. Front lighting has many advantages for the wildlife filmmaker. The colour saturation is very strong and it's often the most appropriate form of lighting when filming dark coated animals as it will show off the fine detail in the animal's coat. The downside to front lighting is that it can cause some harsh shadows. This is especially noticeable when you're shooting groups of animals standing close together as a shadow of one animal falls onto its neighbour. Backlighting is ideal for shooting footage of brightly coloured animals such as kingfishers, pheasants and deer. The best time of day for shooting animals lit from behind is early morning or late in the afternoon when the sun is low in the sky. This will produce a nice halo of light around the subject. When filming animals with backlighting, the sun doesn't have to be directly behind them, otherwise you'll have the sun in shot and the animal will be silhouetted. Instead, make sure the sun is out of the frame and to one side. This will still be more than enough for a backlit shot. 
Side lighting can be particularly effective for bringing out the texture of an animal's long hair while still offering good illumination. When using the sun as a source of side lighting, it's important to pay particular attention to where the shadows fall as they can sometimes distract the viewer's attention away from the animal itself. Of course, the sun isn't always out. Sometimes it's hidden behind clouds. This is known as diffused light and it produces softer and weaker shadows. Bright diffuse light will create strong colours and during these conditions you'll be able to shoot animals from all sides and from many different angles. However, if the cloud cover becomes too thick, the colours will lose their intensity. If this happens, you should stop filming and wait for the conditions to change. Aim to do as much filming as you can during what's called the magic hour. This is the time just after sunrise and just before sunset when the sun is low in the sky. During the magic hour, the sunlight has to pass through more of the atmospheric layer, giving it a warmer cast with richer colours, as well as casting longer, more dramatic shadows. It's possible to achieve some really stunning footage during these times. Whatever you do, avoid filming animals during the late morning and early afternoon when the sun is high in the sky, as this will result in the animal's back being fully lit while its underneath is hidden in almost black shadows. This is the worst time of day for any wildlife filming. There will be occasions where you'll need to supplement the natural light with reflectors or even artificial lights. A simple device such as a small mirror can reflect sunlight into small crevices or the entrance to a burrow to facilitate filming. The more portable Laster light or Photoflex reflectors are more practical as they collapse down into small zip-up cases. I tend to use a reversible one with silver on one side and gold on the other. This gives me the option of reflecting a nice golden warm coloured light onto the subject as well as a standard silver reflector on the other side. Sometimes it's necessary to completely light your subject such as at night. Modern digital camcorders are very sensitive chips so even a household torch can provide sufficient lighting levels to illuminate a small scene such as frogs or insects or even animal behaviour inside burrows where it's important to keep the light levels low so as not to disturb the animals. For macro work it's often necessary to use cold light such as fibre optics. Unlike hot tungsten lighting which could fry your subjects, cold lighting will return a comfortable working environment for you and the animals you're filming. In the case of endoscopes, many of these are self-illuminating with a fibre optic shaft running parallel to the optical shaft within the device. Fieldcraft is a word that's commonly used to describe how well you understand the natural environment you're filming in and the various skills and techniques required to enable you to get close to your subjects without disturbing them. It's good practice to study the species of animal you plan filming so you can learn as much about the animal and its habitat as possible. For example, if you plan to film a barn owl that you know is nesting in nearby farmland, you should find out all you can about the barn owl from books and the internet. Learn about its habits, what time of day or night it hunts, or does other things. What about its senses? Barn owls have great eyesight. Knowing things like this will improve your field craft and help you to get close enough to film without being noticed. It's also a good idea to build relationships with wildlife experts and biologists who operate in the field. Their knowledge can be invaluable in helping you get the footage that you need. If you want to be a great wildlife filmmaker, you must be passionate about your natural history. You should study natural history and wildlife by reading books and magazines, and by watching wildlife programs on television, as well as checking out the many great sources of information available on the internet. Of course, spending time in the field watching wildlife is one of the best ways to learn about field craft. It's important that you study animal behaviour, especially the species that you intend filming. You should invest in a decent pair of binoculars and spend time in the field watching wildlife for long periods, making notes of animal behaviour. You should also spend time learning how to watch and track animals without them spotting you or picking up your scent. You'll be amazed at how much you can pick up by watching wildlife programmes on channels such as the National Geographic and Discovery. 
as well as the wildlife programmes that appear on regular terrestrial television. It's a good idea to record wildlife programmes as this will allow you to study them in great detail later on. Make notes and pay particular attention to composition, angles, the position of the sun and any of the techniques used by the cameramen. Then try and emulate them yourself. Also study the post-production work, how it was cut together, the style of music and of course the narration. When studying wildlife programmes on television have a notepad handy and take notes. You will learn such a lot from studying how the professionals shoot and produce wildlife programmes for television. It's one of the best teaching resources and it's free. It's very important to understand the behaviour of the animals you're trying to film. By understanding their behaviour, you'll have a much better chance of finding them and you'll also be able to predict their actions. If you have time, walk around for a day or two with a pair of binoculars so you can learn about the animal's behaviour. If you want to film deer, for example, then it would help if you knew where to look for them at any given time of day. In the early morning, you'll find them on the edges of the woodland areas, but during the day they tend to stay deep in the woods. You must also make sure you stand downwind from deer so they don't pick up your scent and remain quiet and still and wear camouflage clothing or use a hide. Read up and do a lot of extra research on animal behaviour to educate yourself on the different kinds of terrain that various animals prefer. You can combine this knowledge with an ecozone map of the area you intend filming in and use this extra input to plan your shoot. This might sound like long and tedious research, but I guarantee you'll stand more chance of seeing the animal species you want to film if you have a good understanding of where they're most likely to be. It also helps if you know the terrain you're travelling through. If I'm visiting a park for the very first time, I also read up on it via the park's internet website. This research helps you to gain better understanding of the park's layout and where the animals are at any given time of day. Also, if the park's website has a forum, you can learn from other forum posters where the best spots are. It's also worth spending time talking to the local people and park staff who will know the area and wildlife well. It's so important to know your location before you venture out to start filming, as an unplanned and unresearched day out will usually be an unsuccessful one. It's very easy to get carried away when filming wildlife to get the shot that you want. You might be tempted to purposely disturb a sleeping lion. Let's be honest, a sleeping lion is hardly an interesting subject to film. However, this is the wrong approach and it can be dangerous, so never interfere with an animal's natural behaviour when filming. Your mere presence can often cause a disturbance in the wild, so try and keep your filming low-key, especially when dealing with nestling birds and young animals. Remember, patience is a key requisite for wildlife filmmakers. In the wild, all animals have a space around them that's known as a circle of fear. And if you enter that circle, they'll be inclined to either flee or fight. Unfortunately, when filming wildlife, you often have to enter the circle of fear in order to achieve frame-filling footage. Getting within the circle is the name of the game, and understanding animal behaviour is the key. This is where lots of patience is required. The extent of the circle of fear will vary depending on the species you're trying to film, its habitat, its characteristics, its escape route and the time of year. Wading birds, such as herons, have a very wide circle of fear and they will fly off if you come within several hundred yards. Some garden birds, on the other hand, will let you come within arm's reach, especially during the winter period when they're hungry. You'll need lots of patience when trying to get close to the animals you're filming. If you're using a dome hide, you should only move it forward a few feet at a time, and very slowly. If you're not using a hide, then avoid eye contact with the animal and don't approach them directly. You have to act as if you're not interested in them. When filming potentially dangerous animals, you won't be able to predict what the animal might do if you enter its circle of fear. So have your escape route prepared and any backup plans organised. 
Depending on the species you're filming, you should always wait to get connection with the animal before you start filming. And if you want the animal to look into the camera lens or sit perfectly still for a moment, make a funny noise to attract its attention. Of course, any noise you make will have to be edited out later in post-production. So make sure you record a minute of wild track audio to cover the noise over with during editing. Getting footage of certain animal species such as deer and buffalo is easy when you follow some basic rules. Never approach the animals directly. Instead, let them come to you. Observe from a distance which way the animals are moving whilst grazing. Then skirt around them with your equipment and wait for them to approach you. With a bit of luck, they'll come very close. Well now we're going to be taking a look at doing some macro work and the beauty of this is that because you're working with small animals in a small area you can do this just about anywhere. You can do it in the office, in your living room, in your garage and if I'm travelling around abroad I often use a hotel ensuite bathroom normally because there's no windows so you can control the lighting much better and it's often the coolest room and also if the animals start running around and escaping they've got less places to go in a bathroom than any other room. But here we're in the office and we're going to be filming some frogs. The first thing we're going to be using is this lens that comes with the camera, the JVC camera, in its macro mode. It's got its own macro mode, you can get very close to the animals. After that we'll be looking at using the Nikon adapter on the JVC camera, using a Nikon 35mm lens, either a macro lens or in this case just a standard 50mm lens. And then after that we'll be looking at putting on extension rings either a single extension ring like this or a variety of multiple extension rings. And using these we can film much smaller animals. We can go down to the size of a small beetle such as a ladybird or even green fly using these devices. After that we'll be looking at filming some even smaller animals such as pond life, tiny daphnia, using a stereo microscope with a port and attachment, again a Nikon attachment and putting the JVC camera straight onto the microscope filming down the turret, minute pond life. And related to all this, we'll be looking at using an endoscope like this. We can attach this to the end of the camera and we can plunge this into an ant's nest or a hole in the tree and see what's going on out of sight, deep inside, away from the light. We're going to start with our little frog. Very small, it's only about an inch long, a couple of centimetres. But we can fill the frame easily with this animal using the lens that comes with the camera. I'll put them in situ and we'll start videoing. Right, well the setup we've got here is the Nikon 50mm standard lens attached to a 36mm extension tube attached to the Nikon adapter straight onto the camera. And we use this for very, very small animals. Animals such as this tiny bug, this little beetle larva here. Now you can see just how small this creature is. Yet we will more than fill the frame with this animal. In fact, I doubt whether we'll even get half of this animal in frame at any one time. But we'll give it a go and we'll put him on this leaf and hope he doesn't move around too much. Well here we've attached an endoscope to the camera. It's a stainless steel rigid endoscope. There's a light source that's coming from this uh, fibre optic box here through the fibre optic lead and the light travels through the bottom of the tube 
and the lens itself, the glass lens, is then at the top of the tube and this conveys the image down to the lens. Here the lens is your Nikon 50mm standard lens attached to the Nikon adapter straight onto the camera. So we can actually see what's going on here at the business end. Now you can thrust this into ants nests, even into water, and in this case we're going to put it into this hole in this log and see what's going on hidden inside the log. Well, what we've got here is the ultimate macro setup. We've got the JVC camera attached via a Nikon adapter onto a photography turret onto a stereo microscope. So we can see whatever is down underneath the microscope. And we've got some pond life under here, and we're focusing in on a Daphnia or a water flea. Now, these things are so small, you could fit 10 onto a pinhead. But we can zoom in, and we can start filming, and we can see its little legs beating on the fold-out screen up here, and even its eye and its antennae moving around in a little pool of water. One of the most important elements of wildlife filmmaking is your safety, so don't put yourself in any danger. Some wildlife filmmakers will do just about anything to get a good shot in the can. It's better to rely on experts for specific advice on any potentially dangerous filming situations such as ropes, caving and climbing. And if you're working alone, always tell someone where you're going and what you're doing. Once at the location, be observant and look out for warning notices and always ask permission before venturing onto private land. It's important to understand the subtle body language of potentially dangerous animals. For example, if a moose turns and points its antlers in your direction, you should back off immediately. If you're approached by horses with their ears laid back against their heads, you should move away. Or if cattle are stamping their hooves, you should be cautious. It's important that you learn subtle body language indications like these when filming potentially dangerous animals. Another very important point to remember is to never cut off an animal's escape route, for their safety and your own. If an animal has no other way of escaping except straight past you, that's probably what it will do. Depending on the species you intend filming, you should take someone with you who can act as a lookout for potential danger while you're busy filming. If you know you're going to be filming potentially dangerous animals, the first thing you should do when you turn up at your shooting location is to plan your escape route, just in case. Trust me, the last thing you'll want to be doing is planning your escape route when there's an angry animal charging towards you. Another very important consideration for those who are new to wildlife filmmaking is ethics. It's important to understand that the welfare of the animal is more important than you getting the shot that you want. As a wildlife filmmaker you have a responsibility to ensure that nothing you do is in any way cruel to the animal you're filming and you don't have any detrimental effect on the ecosystem you're working in. The Filmmakers for Conservation group have put together a set of guidelines that you should read. 
These can be found in the bonus material section of this DVD. Finally, in some countries, there are legal restrictions on approaching animals at certain times of the year. These laws and regulations must be obeyed no matter what. In the UK, for instance, rare birds must not be approached or disturbed near their nest, unless you've obtained a license to do so first. We want to get some shots of this little tortoise here, so what we've done, we've rigged up a small set inside the studio. On the bottom of the set we have some substrate, and on top of that some leaves, and it's backed off with a log, and you must try and get these from the actual habitat from which the animal comes, so it looks quite realistic when you film it. In the background we've got some blue card, in case we just it just creeps into vision so it looks like the sky, and we've lit it from above, which is a natural way, using these two video lights over the top. Now this particular set is a glass tank with no front and in this case it's got slots either side so if you wanted to you could actually have the front on the tank let your animals settle in there for a few days so it feels secure and then when you're ready to film slide out the front so you can get your camera in to start shooting and that's just what I'm going to do now. When filming animals, you need to be aware of your smell and appearance. As I've mentioned already, you won't want to go on a wildlife shoot coated in aftershave and deodorants, as prey animals such as deer will smell you coming a mile off. You'll also need to be aware of the direction you're approaching the animal from. If you approach from an upwind direction, the animals will pick up your scent in the wind long before you get to them. If you approach them from a downwind direction, you'll be able to get very close before they pick up your scent. The two main senses of most animals are hearing and smell, not vision. No matter how well camouflaged you are, a mammal is far more likely to hear or smell you long before it ever sees you. Even if it means you have to make a long detour to change your angle of approach, you will stand a much better chance of getting a lot closer. I once witnessed a cheetah circle over a mile to get downwind of a herd of zebra before moving in for the kill. So learn a vital lesson from the animals themselves. The best way to find out which way the wind's blowing is to either drop something light, such as a blade of grass or a handful of dust, to see which way it blows. Another good method is to turn your head slowly until you feel the wind is blowing directly into the centre of your face. Then as long as you're walking with the wind and blowing into your face, you'll be approaching the animals from a downwind direction. Of course, this isn't always possible, but if you have the opportunity to approach the animal from downwind, you'll stand a much better chance of getting closer. Speed is also a factor you need to consider. Many animals have eyes that are very sensitive to movement and insensitive to non-movement or very slow movement. So move very slowly and gently when approaching animals. In general, prey animals such as deer have an excellent sense of smell while predators such as big cats have excellent eyesight. You'll want to avoid wearing bright orange style cagoules or other bright and colourful clothing as this will make you stick out like a sore thumb to animals in the wilderness. Instead, wear camouflage clothing whenever possible, such as a kind that can be bought quite cheaply from any army surplus stores. The same principle goes for your equipment. It would be pointless going to the trouble of camouflaging yourself only to leave a bright white lens exposed on a camera such as a Canon XL2. This will stand out like a beacon in the forest. Companies like Wildlife Watching Supplies 
make camouflage covers for lenses, cameras and other pieces of equipment such as tripod leg sleeves. The trick is to try and turn yourself and your equipment into a chameleon. Of course you won't always need to go to these extremes if you're shooting from a dome hide or from a wooden box hide in a nature reserve or even in a safari park. But if you're trying to film deer in the wild then extreme camouflage methods will be needed. When you're setting up your equipment do it quietly and make sure you avoid unzipping bags or tearing open velcro straps in a loud manner otherwise any wildlife in your vicinity will immediately flee. When it comes to clothing, try to avoid wearing anything with zips and velcro fasteners or materials that are noisy, such as nylon. As for your equipment, if it has any rattly bits, be sure to put some gaffer tape over them to prevent rattles and clanging sounds. Finally, removing the lens cap from your camcorder should be the very last thing you do, as it can reflect light off the sun as you move it around when setting it up. This will draw attention to you, so make sure the camera is set up on the tripod and you're ready to start filming before removing the lens cap. The best wildlife footage is where the subject fills most of the frame. People like to see the detail on animals, such as the colours on a kingfisher or the scaly skin of a lizard. The trick is not to invade their space, particularly where young are involved, such as bird chicks. This is another fine example of why camcorders with interchangeable lenses like the JVC are ideal for wildlife work, as a telephoto lens will allow you to get an extremely close view of your subject while maintaining a healthy distance. Professional wildlife filmmakers always use long telephoto lenses to enable them to get the shots they need. Using a portable hide, such as a dome hide, will allow you to get really close to many animals without being noticed. However, there is a technique to this and there are a few basic rules that you will need to follow. When filming from a hide, the most important thing to consider is your safety. Think very carefully about the position of your hide. Erecting a hide near the edge of a cliff to film seabirds would be too risky and dangerous as you can become disoriented as to your exact position when you've been in a hide for a few hours. Also the wind could pick up and drag the hide over the edge, so it's vital that you think about your safety when positioning your hide. The chances are if you're filming from a hide it will be in a location that's not often visited by people so it's important to tell a family member exactly where you're going and what you're doing and how long you'll be there. You should also take a fully charged mobile phone, a small first aid kit, a torch, plenty of food and drink and some extra warm clothing. But remember no smelly foods. This is no place for a Chinese takeaway so keep to simple sandwiches and the like. If you have to be filming in a very remote location, I recommend taking some flares to attract attention from a distance. The modern dome hide is incredibly well camouflaged, waterproof and very quick and easy to set up and take down. It's designed with openings for the lens to poke through with a camouflage lens cover that fastens around the lens with velcro straps. If you're using a hide in woodland areas, always screen the outside of the hide by using some natural materials. Grab a few stray branches off the ground and lean them against the hide to help disguise it even more. But don't go breaking branches off trees. If there's nothing lying around the floor, then leave the hide as it is. When it comes to using a hide, there are a few other things to remember. Most animals aren't stupid, especially prey animals, that are generally a lot more alert with an acute sense of smell. When filming prey animals, it's important that you don't smell of deodorant, aftershave, soap or any other unnatural smells, as they'll be able to smell you coming from a considerable distance. Unnatural smells also include sweets, especially chewing gum and mints, as they give off a very strong and unnatural smell to prey animals. Other species may have great eyesight, so you'll have to watch what you wear. No bright coloured cagoules or other brightly coloured clothing. The chances are that you will be seen entering your hide by wildlife and may need to creep into it before dawn. If possible, bring along a friend. It's assumed that most animals can't count. So if two people enter the hide, then one leaves after a few minutes, the local wildlife assumes that everything has returned to normal. This is where you get to sit in your hide for long periods of time, 
so be sure to take plenty of food and water as well as a receptacle in case you need to relieve yourself. If you leave the hive to do this, the chances are you'll blow your cover for the rest of the day. Well, in this part of the DVD, I wanted to demonstrate how you can film animals in a, a sort of captive conditions to make them look as though you're actually filming them in the wild. Here we're at the Norfolk Wildlife Park, and they've got a very nice enclosure here for red-eared sliders, which is a type of freshwater terrapin. And the good thing about this enclosure is it's very natural, it's got lots of plant growth around it, and it's also got a very low fence, which allows you to shoot over the top rather than through the mesh. When you're filming animals in a situation like this, you must try and film them in such a way that you don't reveal that they are in fact in the UK because these are natives of North America. Now the water itself is fine when they're floating in the water, it could be anywhere. When they're sitting on a log at the side of the pond, that could be anywhere. There are certain plants growing around the pond which are native to both America and Britain, such as the nettles, they're fine. If there are any plants which you're not sure about, either try to avoid getting them in the shot or to make sure they're out of focus so they can't be identified when you do the shots. Now some of these terrapins are now coming out onto the bank. Uh, they've got used to my presence now, so we're going to have a go at filming these in close-up. Believe it or not, if your wildlife programme was made up of nothing but shots of animals, it would be quite hard to watch. Your viewers need time to pause for reflection every now and then and to take in what they have seen. To enable them to do that, you'll need to film some nice cutaway shots that don't actually have any animals in them. Next time you watch a wildlife programme on television, take note of how many of those shots don't contain any animals. You will see plenty of scenic or artsy cutaways of landscapes, sunsets, close-ups of flowers and leaves, a river, perhaps a spider's web, or simply dew on a long blade of grass. All these shots are designed to help break up the programme, and they usually come when the programme reaches the end of a sequence, or is about to move on to the next stage. Establishing cutaway shots of longer duration are also usually accompanied by some appropriate music. Always get plenty of cutaways like these from the same spot that you've just been filming your wildlife as it will give you a lot more freedom when editing and they can help with things like covering up any nasty jump cuts. Well we're back here at the Norfolk Wildlife Park and this time we're going to turn our hand to filming some prairie dogs. Now prairie dogs aren't dogs, they are in fact large rodents which live in North America. And they've got a very nice setup here, but you can hear that there's a road nearby. You can probably also hear that there are members of the public walking around the park and talking, and there are even British birds singing. But that doesn't matter. What matters are the shots, and later on you can put your own sound effects on, wind noise, rustle noise, and completely obliterate the, the noises that we're recording today. The animals themselves are in this wooden enclosure, 
which has a large mound in the middle, and that really does help us a lot. If we shot from the angle you're looking at now, you would see the prairie dogs with the other fence in the background. So what we're going to do, we're going to shoot from a lower angle, and just get the top of the mound with the prairie dogs, and in the background the trees out of focus. And give this, this gives us a much more natural setting for our subjects. So if the prairie dogs behave, we'll get some shots of them. One of the most difficult areas of wildlife videography is filming birds in flight. Smaller birds such as tits and songbirds can be very difficult to film in flight because of their relative size in the viewfinder and they often change direction extremely quickly. Larger and more sluggish birds such as cormorants and herons are easier to film in flight as they fill a larger area of the viewfinder and they don't make sudden changes in direction. For this reason you should practice filming larger birds like herons when honing your techniques. The easiest way to begin learning how to film birds in flight is to film them as they fly away from a perch such as a branch or fence post. This will give you time to compose a shot and set the exposure. It's a good idea to take the exposure from the ground at the base of the tree where the birds are perched otherwise you might end up with a bird being silhouetted against the sky. Once you've set up your exposure and focused on the bird Frame the bird so it's at the top right or left side of your viewfinder or fold out LCD screen. This is because when most birds take off, they drop from their perch, then swoop back as they gain momentum. Also allow for looking room, or in this case, flying room. If the bird's perched on a branch and is facing to the left as you view in the viewfinder, position the bird at the top right hand side of the viewfinder. This way, when it flies from the branch, it will drop into the frame nicely, then you can smoothly pan as it flies from right to left. You'll have to hit the record button beforehand, then wait patiently with your hand on the tripod pan handle, ready to follow the bird once it takes off. How long you'll have to wait for the bird to fly away will depend on the species. Again, this is where patience is required. Well here we are at the Norfolk Wildlife Park Lynx enclosure and it's a good place to film for many reasons. Firstly it's a very large enclosure with natural vegetation. It's got big well established trees growing within it, it's also got dead tree trunks lying around and some rocky outcrops so the animals look like they're in a natural setting. It's got a very large fence surrounding it for obvious reasons seven meters high except for this section here which is replaced by a wall that's only one meter high at this side and yet it's five meters at the other side this allows you to get fantastic views without looking through mesh at the animals and to get your camera over the top of the wall to peer into the enclosure now this also has the effect that you're actually looking down on the animals so you very rarely see the fence that's about a hundred yards away at the far wall of the enclosure and even if you did see that then using this type of lens a very long lens and a very wide F setting, then you're going to get that out of focus while the animal itself is perfectly focused. Now, these animals are parading down up and down below this wall beneath me here because they're waiting to be fed. Now they're going to be fed on European rabbits, wild rabbits from the surrounding fields. And this also helps you in your filming because it's actually eating an animal which it would be eating in the wild. So the shots that you get will look natural. So let's see what we can get using this camera.
OK, so once you've shot all the footage to tape, you're going to have to edit it all together to make up a complete program. During this section of the DVD, I'm not going to go through all the hardware and software options as there are just too many to get through and you could make a DVD on that subject alone. Basically, the two most common professional level software packages are Apple's Final Cut Pro for the Mac and Avid Express Pro for the PC. Although Avid Express Pro runs on both the Mac and PC, Final Cut Pro is for the Mac only. However, the software package is not the important part. It's how you cut your film together that counts. You might already have a different editing package, such as Adobe Premiere for PC, and all Apple computers come with a great little application already installed called iMovie. iMovie is a relatively basic editing package when compared to Final Cut Pro, but you can still cut your wildlife program together using software like this. After all, most professional films are edited using nothing more than straight cuts with a simple fade in at the beginning and a fade out at the end with separate music and narration tracks. How you approach editing is far more important than the software and hardware that you use. What's important is that you keep it tasteful, which means no gimmicky or tasteless transitions. Stick to straight cuts as wipes and fancy 3D effect transitions simply look amateurish. At the most, you might need a little fade in or cross dissolve between scenes, but nothing more. Again, watch professional wildlife programs on television to see how they're edited together. When you're cutting your program together, don't be afraid to be ruthless with your clips. If they're dull or uninteresting, don't use them. And when you've edited some clips together to make up a sequence, cut the clips in a way that they're not too long and boring, but not so short that the viewer doesn't have time to take them in either. This is where watching wildlife programs on television will teach you a great deal about editing. Learn from how the professionals cut wildlife programs together, paying particular attention to how many seconds a clip stays on screen before cutting to another one. If a clip doesn't carry the story forward or seems out of place, simply cut it out. Always try and start the various chapters to your program with an establishing shot, perhaps a landscape. Then cut to medium shots, then close-up shots. This way the viewer will know a bit about the animal's habitat. Also, try and build up some kind of dilemma or conflict. For example, will the buzzard chick survive the winter ahead? Or which of the two competing lions will win out over a stretch of territory? Here are a few other rules that you should follow in the edit suite. Allow the animal to walk out of frame before cutting to the next shot. This is more pleasing to the eye, especially when cutting to another angle of the same animal. It also makes for a nice cutting point to any other scene. Don't cut from a shot of an animal walking in one direction to the same animal suddenly walking in the opposite direction. This is known as crossing the line and it will disorientate the viewer. Instead, put in a shot of the animal walking straight to or away from camera between the two clips. This will avoid crossing the line and will look more pleasing to the viewer. Use cutaways to avoid jump cuts. These could be close-up shots of the animal's eyes, tail or feet. Using cutaways such as these will make the transition from one medium shot of an animal to another medium shot of the same animal more pleasing. Close each chapter or scene by holding on a shot for longer than usual. This gives the viewer time to pause and reflect before the next scene starts. You'll normally add some appropriate music to this longer shot as music suggests we are at the end of a section. Start each new chapter or scene with an establishing shot such as a landscape, sunset, sunrise or a lake. This will suggest to the viewer that time has passed. Again, Add music if required. As I've already mentioned, sound is just as important as the images. In many wildlife programs, the sound is even more important, as it's the soundtrack and the narration that hold the program together. Without music and narration, it would have no story or emotion whatsoever. There might have been times during filming where it wasn't possible to pick up the sounds of the animals. 
This could have been due to the animal being a considerable distance away and its sounds it created were barely audible. This is where Foley sound comes in. The term Foley comes from the man Jack Foley who established the technique many years ago. This is sound that is recorded separately to the images and then added during editing. Foley sound is usually recorded after the event if it was not possible to get the sound at the time. You could use Foley sound in a shot of a heron poised perfectly still in the water, then suddenly darting its head down into the lake to catch a fish. If this shot was filmed using a very long telephoto lens, the chances are that no sound would have been picked up at the time. So you would record a separate splashing sound, possibly stabbing your fingers into a bucket of water placed next to a microphone. Then during the edit, you would put this sound on the audio track directly under the clip of the heron catching the fish, synchronising it to the image so the splashing sound is in perfect time with the heron's head penetrating the water's surface. The chances are that you'll have to play around recording Foley sounds for your wildlife program. I've already mentioned the importance of recording a wild track at every location you film in. During editing you'll be glad you did. Just as you might need to record some Foley sounds to enhance your program, you'll also need to cover up blemishes in the audio with your wild track. Blemishes could include an aeroplane going overhead or a possible audio dropout on the tape. Then of course there's the music. Just about every wildlife program ever made uses music. The chances are you'll be using music during the opening titles and end credit sequences as well as some incidental music where required and perhaps some carefully chosen music to match the mood of your program or to create tension or drama. What style of music you choose will of course depend on the theme of your program and only you will be able to decide that. There are many options available when it comes to the music soundtrack for your wildlife program. The ideal option would be to use a professional composer who specialises in writing soundtracks for TV programmes, but this option can be quite expensive. If you're lucky enough to know a musician with good composing skills, then perhaps you could pay them a modest fee to score your wildlife program with a suitable style of music. Another option is to use commercial music just like you'd buy from your local record store. Prices for commercial music vary depending on the artist and the song. An older and less popular song from the 70s would cost much less than a recent number one hit from a popular and well-known band. You will need to fill out a license application form from the PRS and the MCPS, as well as getting permission from the record company. You'll need to state the band, the track, the title and nature of your programme and which TV channel it's going to be shown on or how many you expect to distribute and sell on DVD. You'll also need to tell them how many seconds of the song you want to use. They're usually sold in blocks of 20 seconds. Based on the information you put on the form, you'll be given a quote. This might not be as much as you expect and using a well-known song in your program can increase the production value, but make sure you research the whole process properly and get permission of all the right people. The cheapest option by far is to use royalty-free music CDs. Companies like AKM specialise in royalty-free music CDs. In fact, they even have CDs that are specific to wildlife moods. These CDs generally cost 20 to 30 pounds, and once you've bought the CD, you then own a license to use the music in your wildlife programs for either television or DVD sale with nothing else to pay. Adding music to a wildlife program is an art in itself. I suggest being subtle with music. Don't make it too overpowering. Keep it more laid back and in the background. And just because you have music, it doesn't mean you have to have it for the entire duration. Music should enhance your wildlife program so only add it where it's really needed. Try and match the feel and mood of the music to your sequences. You could start with some slow, moody music whilst a fox stokes a pheasant. Then have some fast, fanatic music as a fox runs and pounces, and then perhaps some quite incidental background music as a fox returns to its den with a catch. 
Once you've edited your program and added the music soundtrack and the narration, you should take plenty of time getting the levels right. You don't want any sudden peaks in the audio. The music track should be well balanced with the narration, so it doesn't dominate the narrator's voice. Also, listen carefully to any foley sounds and wild tracks that have been added, making sure they're in sync and at the same level as the rest of the audio. Writing and recording the narration for your wildlife program requires skill and practice. In fact, when it comes to recording the narration, you will probably be better off hiring a professional narrator or voiceover artist who has the right kind of voice and knows exactly how fast or how slow to pitch it. Writing narration is different to writing regular literary text that appears in print. How text is written for a novel is different from how text is written that's going to be read out loud by a presenter or narrator. When you're writing narration, make sure you write it in the same language as you would use when talking aloud. It's also a good idea to read your narration text out loud as you write it, because lots of sentences read okay when you read it to yourself in your head, but when you read it out loud, you often stumble with sentences that don't flow off the tongue or combinations of words that are difficult to say one straight after the other. If you shot your footage first and are writing the narration after, don't simply describe what the viewer is watching on the screen. Instead, give the viewer additional information that's not obvious from the images alone. For example, if your program is showing images of a cheetah feeding its young on fresh prey, don't state in your narration that the cheetah is feeding its young. Instead, your narration could perhaps explain how long it will be before their mother needs to catch their next meal. This will add to the viewer's understanding of the film, as well as making it an educational and more pleasurable viewing experience, as it contains extra information that the viewer wouldn't necessarily know already. It's also important to throw in some questions that will be answered later in the program, such as, these baby buzzards are now ready to fly from the nest for the very first time, but will they survive in the harsh winter ahead? Or you could throw in a teaser to add tension to your program, for example, if you were filming a program about turtles, you could have your narration read, even if these baby turtles survive being eaten by predators as they make their short journey across the sand to the sea, there are plenty of other predators lurking in the ocean once they get there. Questions and teasers like these will keep your viewer interested as they'll want those questions answered and they'll want to see how the teasers pan out over the duration of the program. If you are confident you have a good speaking voice and can do the narration yourself, you should follow these basic rules. First, when you are recording your narration, imagine you are telling a story to someone in your living room. Pace yourself at a comfortable speed. Most people talk too fast when learning how to narrate. It's a good idea to record yourself and listen to the recording. You'll be amazed at how it sounds on playback and you'll be able to learn from this. You might think you're reading slowly, but on playback it could sound too fast. Always put emotion into it, act out the part, and it's okay to sound genuinely enthusiastic or even amused. Presenters like Jonathan Scott and Simon King, who present the BBC TV series Big Cat Diaries, do this all the time. You can either record your narration whilst viewing the programme on the timeline during editing, or record it separately then cut it to the timeline later. Choose the option you feel most comfortable with. If you've hired a professional narrator, you should sit with them and act as director, and don't be afraid to ask them to reread passages in a different way if you're not happy with the emphasis or speed. When you're recording narration, make sure you choose a quiet room and draw the curtains. This will help dampen the sound and reduce reverberation. Set your microphone up on a stand so it's positioned about 10 centimeters from the narrator's mouth. You should also buy a music stand as this will allow you to put your script at a comfortable reading height and will prevent paper sounds being picked up by the microphone as you shuffle them in your hands. If you're recording your own narration, it's a good idea to wear enclosed headphones during recording sessions so you can monitor your own voice. 
Practice doing this for a while until you can flow at a comfortable speed with emotion and learn how to enjoy the sound of your own voice. I'd also recommend buying a device called a popper stopper. The popper stopper is basically a piece of finely woven acoustic material stretched across a circular frame about 6 inches in diameter. It allows the sound waves through but stops the air blast from hitting the microphone. Whenever you read aloud the words beginning with the letter P, it causes a small burst of air to hit the microphone, which can cause a recording to distort or peak momentarily. The popper stopper is placed a few inches away from the mic and it will prevent distortion and popping sounds. Adding titles and end credits to your program should be the final stage of your edit. Usually the titles that precede the program would be fairly short and simple. They usually give details of the production company, the title of the program and the name of the narrator. Then the end credits would list everyone who was involved in the production as well as thanking any people or organisations as required. When putting your titles and credits together on the timeline, keep them simple and above all tasteful. You don't want to use any gaudy coloured text with big drop shadows as they tend to look amateurish. Watch the title and credit sequences on professionally produced television wildlife programs and learn from them. Keep it simple. White text on a black background works best for the end credits and lower third text works best for the opening credits if it's overlaid on video images. Well, we've now come to the end of the DVD. I hope you've enjoyed watching it as much as I've enjoyed making it and hopefully you've picked up many useful hints and tips that will improve your wildlife filmmaking in future. Thanks for watching and goodbye.